Welcome to the Daily Edge Podcast. Today we have a very special podcast. We're going to talk about where to invest after COVID. And as my guest, we have Daniel Barris. He's a real estate investment fund manager. We've known each other for a couple of years. And I'm always impressed about his ability to shift in the market, his ability to see the trends and make money for his clients. My name is Raul Villases, and you're listening to the Daily Edge Podcast. Learn the systems and the process that successful businessmen are using to take their lives and their business to the next level. Welcome to the Daily Edge Podcast, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So tell me, the question from every single one of the investors that, that, that I know is, what's going to happen to real estate? What, what do you see in real estate, especially after COVID? Everybody's wondering, where do I invest? What's the, the light at the end of the tunnel? Are the prices going to drop? Is it commercial? Is it residential? Is it buildings? Is it single family? How can we help the audience listening to this to see the light at the end of the tunnel after COVID? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting this question every day now, and we're tracking extensive data. You know, that will constantly tell us, okay, what's happening per asset class in different markets. And really, coronavirus, it um, it shifted a lot for us. Um, you know, as you can imagine, there are sectors, different asset classes, such as office or retail, or some of those that are really suffering. Uh, but the other ones, however, are doing really well. Um, so in terms of coronavirus, just a couple trends that we're seeing, you know, we're uh, a lot of, a lot of people are moving out of the bigger cities, um, you know, getting out of those concentrated areas, migrating into, you know, areas like Florida. Uh, they're moving away from apartment buildings. They're changing their space, right? So a lot of them are working from home. A uh, significant amount of remote workers now that can work from home, right? So uh, they've got to upgrade their space or move out of their area, you know. So where I am, Florida, it's uh, you know people can work from anywhere, so they're they're moving here. Um, so you we're tracking the data such as like one way U-Haul trips and scheduling, so that shows us where these people are migrating from and when they're coming. Yeah. So uh, other trends, you know, you have, you know, a deficit overall in, in uh, you know, a lot of some of the commercial sectors. And, and uh, like I said, office is, is, is the biggest one. Um, you know, when you look at the volatility of real estate in general, it, it, it really it, it, it comes down to that job growth. Right. So you look at different markets where maybe unemployment was average. Right. Uh, versus, say, a market where you know, it was decent unemployment, like where we're at, there was way too many jobs for uh, the amount of people. So now it kind of balanced out a little bit. Um, so those are some of the trends, you know, we're able to fill some of these jobs now. And, uh, you know, every market's a little different, you know, thankfully, Florida, um, we opened up pretty early uh, yeah. compared to other markets. Yeah. And uh, yeah. one of the things that I see, um you know, here in the local market is the ability to now work from home and having a trend to have a virtual office. Uh, and one of the three rules in real estate is location, location, location. <laughs> but now that has changed because now location really, uh, people could work from home from any location. So one of the trends that we're seeing, and we, we were talking um, off uh, camera before, is the, uh, the opportunities in the market the opportunities that, that lie ahead. And I think that one of the things that we have to start looking at is the behavior of companies, the behavior of consumers that now some people don't have to live close by their where they work. Now the commute is pretty much non-existent because you could jump in a Zoom meeting and you're in the office. You could go into Zoom yeah. and, and now, you know, we have a, a, a virtual work environment. So how does that affect, um, I mean, I can't jump in a Zoom and be in a beach, <laughs> uh, Daniel. <laughs> so, so you have the advantage in Florida that you actually have the weather as well and, and the lifestyle. So what are you seeing about the trends of people moving to, to Florida? Because now we're seeing, you, you, you and I were talking about how people are expediting their move because that's a dream. You know, most people is like, you know, dreams that once you retire, you're gonna buy a house on the beach. Once you retire, you're gonna move to Florida. What are some of the trends that you're seeing when it comes to people moving into Florida? Sure. <clears throat> so a lot of people are, are, are pushing up their retirement plans. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big part of it. 
you know, when, when you, in terms of the people, you know, Florida historically was always retirees, baby boomers coming down. Now, when you look at the numbers, it's more in the, you know, 30s and 40s where the mm-hmm. migration of those people, and that's basically for the jobs. I mean, Florida's by far the fastest growing state in the nation uh, in terms of net migration. And what we're seeing for those businesses, and again, we're tracking those one-way trips from U-Haul, which by the way, there's a ton of them coming down. And um, you know, with all this coronavirus, we're tracking, okay, what kind of product do they really wanna live in? Mm. You know, an example of that. So in our fund, we're building, you know, single family rental, build for rent product, right? So we've modified our floor plan a little bit to be able to cater towards that, you know, that, that office, that extra office space that people want uh, as our, you know, our tenants. So in terms of businesses, you know, a lot, a lot of them have, have really said, okay, that's it. We're going to go remote permanent. You have these options, right? So uh, office space is, is clear now. And, and uh, you know, you've got a ton of people moving here. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's definitely a big trend. Um, and and the one, one thing that I see, especially here in, uh, in the East Coast, the Northeast, is the lifestyle change. Uh, you know, people don't want to be in in a place where they are bundled up in a, in a room anymore. Uh, they want to have this open spaces. They want to have all, all you know, office buildings that, that create amenities. And I think, uh, you know, most of us uh, we were trained with like the mentality of more, like more, squ- uh, uh, more is is best, right? More people crammed in is best. Like the more people that you have in your office, you know, the more productive they become. The the more energy you create, the better. But the reality is that it's not just about how many people you could you could hire, how many people could be in, in your company. Is what's the lifestyle that you can provide for them? And and sometimes yeah. what we have to start looking at when it comes to investing in real estate is the location where they have amenities that now because of coronavirus are going to be necessary like open spaces, social distancing, parks. I mean, that's needed more. And I have investors coming in from New York all the time looking at Connecticut saying, you know, we're moving to Connecticut because we're tired of, of living in buildings now. Uh, I have also have investors that own buildings and, and they're saying they're looking to adapt because, you know, some people are moving out of the buildings and, you know, they're not renting as fast as they used to. So uh, in Florida, there's always been that conversation about buying multi-units, you know, 300, 400, 500 units versus single family homes and or buying, uh, you know, pretty much almost uh, new construction and turn them into, into multi-units. What's your take on it when it comes to uh, multi-family apartment buildings versus the single family strategy? Yeah, so we've invested in both. Um, you know, in my space, we've done a lot of single family rentals and uh you know we helped some big major funds assemble that so you know we're um my other company we're we're the company that basically these big funds would call to assemble these massive amounts of of volume for that kind of product whether it's you know apartments small apartments duplexes single family etc so when you look at the the main so comparing apartment buildings versus single family I mean, apartment buildings, a lot of reason why those people love that area is, is the amenities, right? So everybody hanging out, you know, concentrated areas. Now people do want their space, you know? So even locally here, there's people that are getting out of those apartments, moving into the single family. And, you know, in terms as an investor, uh, when you look at the risk, the volatility uh, versus the return, you know, single family by far, our numbers are, you know, they're, they're crushing the apartment buildings. and um for several reasons you know you have with single family you have a little more exit strategies keep in mind you know with us investing in single family rentals the technology to build those same efficiencies compared to a multifamily has come a long ways Mm, right so um you know that that was the main reason why an investor would buy a 300 unit versus say single family of 300 units because the efficiencies weren't there it was a little more difficult to manage now with technology and obviously with that demand it's come a long way so for us the equity that's built in to the single family is by far um you know a, a lot better and you have a little more exit strategies right so a lot of the, the the properties on the single family side we have tenants that are set up 
you know, with long-term rentals, they're staying four to five years because they're buying it at a high retail price. Mm. So there's all of these unique things that you can do uh, with the single family. They just, you know, it's a little more difficult with the apartments. Um, and, you know, it, it, it creates, um, you know, I would also say add to that when you look at the single family space versus the apartment space of the institutional investors, mm. right? For the longest time, you know, the apartment, they wanted the apartments because of those efficiencies and because they could invest in bulk and capture more of that all, you know, in yeah. fewer transactions. Well, now, I mean, that those are some of our exit strategies, right? So we have those institutional buyers. So we're, we'll build 50 homes as an example and sell it off to them, right? So that's only accessible for a 50 pack or more, right? And they're paying really good prices. Uh, so even that they're able to, Get those efficiencies and you know when you look at articles after COVID. so again i i i believed in the sfr single family rental space uh even prior to this we've been working in that space for a little while experimenting with the build for rent which is what we're doing now um but when you look at post covid there has been article after, i've got 10 articles right now and you know it's J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs. I mean, you name it. They're, they're talking about how they believe in the SFR space. They're jumping into that space. They've got you know proven data of low volatility and high returns. And when you compare, like right now, what you would invest in, right? So if an investor, like I have an investor friend, who called me and said, pulled their money out of the stock market, said, "Hey, I got a pile of cash. What do I do?" You know, I, I, I'm kind of tired of playing the roller coaster game in the stock market. I did well with it, um, but, you know, I want to diversify a little bit. And he said, well, I, I like real estate, but where real estate, what kind of real estate? And then we drilled it down. So let's, get, let's look at the asset classes. Look, let's look at the risk. You know, why is single family rentals less risky? Well, when you look at the numbers based on the rental rates, they've dropped less, but also since the you know the boom back in you know 2005 and six and then the crash afterwards uh, a lot of the single family rentals were under foreclosure well since the frank dodd act and a lot of these things that tightened up the lending space because i mean literally i i would i was going to my barber and he was like yeah i just bought four houses for a thousand dollars it's like you know that, it was so was messed a, up everybody that was, was good old the days. that was the good old days man you you know you were in a Something was gonna give when you're uh, the guy who's cutting your hair, doing your landscape, and, and doing all these things is trying to give you financial advice or a mortgage or refinance your mortgage. That's when you know that something was going on, and the same thing happened to me. And, <laughs> and and the difference I think between you know 2008 because we're talking about 2008 and now it's, it's 2020, and now is a com completely different animal because it's three things that are that are different. Uh, and a lot of people say, Raul, there's gonna be a huge crash in real estate. You know, it's gonna be worse than 2008. And and I always tell them is I think three things have changed. Number one is technology. You know, in 2008, if you if you look at it, social media wasn't wasn't uh, around as much, so the data was always behind. You know, even though social media uh, was present, and we, we I think YouTube just started in 2008, 2007. Uh, technology has changed dramatically. Uh, second is uh, the behavior of consumer. Like we have now all the millennials that they, they don't want to buy. They want to rent. So they're going to be really good land uh, tenants for landlords. And then the third thing is the financing. In 2008, you couldn't get a loan for, for 3.0 or 3.5 or, or even in the, in, the, in the fives. In 2008, you were lucky if you got a 6 or a 7%. So all those three things, technology, uh, behavior of uh, consumer behavior and financing is what's going to make this new wave of real estate an opportunity. But it's yeah. not, it's, it's not about and the biggest mistake that people make in real estate. I think that they think it's going to be easy and they think it's going to be easy. I'm going to watch this, this video in, in, uh, in uh, YouTube and somebody flipped a house and they made a hundred thousand dollars. Those, that, those days, first of all, that you find properties like that and you flip them and you make a hundred thousand dollars just by flipping the contract. I don't know if you ever done that, uh, Daniel, but back in the days, you used to flip a contract. It was literally, there was zero, zero effort to do that. You, but you put a house on the market. You, you, I mean, you, you see a house on the market, you put a down payment, you lock it in and you could actually sell it a week or two weeks later and flip the contract and make 50 or hundred thousand dollars because the market was so hot. I don't think that's the case right now. We're not seeing that. So if you want to make money in real estate, you have to put in the work. You have to be willing to get dirty or you have to be able to, to look at the 
analytics and be smart about about your investment. And I love what you're saying that yeah. people are pulling out from the from the market and asking you where <clears> should I invest in real estate because that's the question that 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 we need to start looking at right now. Where are the trends going? It, before it used to be just invest. My advice to people is always used to be just invest in your local market because you could feel it, you could see it, right? Now it's changed. Now you can invest anywhere in, in, in the nation because now technology is there as long as you have people around you that you could trust. Because the worst thing to do is, I mean, I have some real estate also in Florida, I have people who invest in Connecticut that are from, from different parts of the country, but there is a system in place that we could actually track down what's going on with the property. And that's that's the, the game changer now in real estate, that technology is really helping investors see and become transparent to the property manager, become transparent to the people who are who are who are uh, taking care of the property, become transparent to even your business partners to actually see what's going on. Before it used to be like, let me, you know, give me your money, and I'm gonna invest in real estate, and I, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you when we make money or not. Now technology is able to to create transparency, so you could see the project, you could see what's going on, you could actually see what's what's happening with your with your money. Absolutely, yeah. Now you're right. And that's a comfort level that people have that's way different. You know, when you look at, I mean, just Zillow, right? I mean, it's been right around YouTube time, you know, it hasn't been out that long. I mean, people just feel more comfortable buying a remote, investing a remote, or, you know, doing their own analysis, right? There's a lot of tools out there that, that will help. Now, obviously investing in real estate, you want to make sure you have a good team, right? Or you invest in a fund, people that's already done it you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel and that's a key thing a lot of people ask ask me for mentorship and you know always get hit up in social media raul uh, help me invest in real estate help me you know become wealthy uh, help me make money i think that's a that's a wrong approach when it comes to finding somebody who is going to um to help you i think more is what's the value you could bring right what's the value especially what mentorship now as an investor what you're looking for is a track record because I tell you, people who have a good track record also have lost in the market. They've learned from the losses, but at the same time, they adapt faster than the guys who are losing. And that's one of the things that, that, I, that I see with, with Daniel, what he's doing is that he's always adapting to the market. He's always moving into, into a new, the, the new trends. And that's what's important for you to, to see who you trust with your money, who you trust with your ideas. They have to have an ability to adapt because the market is changing and, and the single family market, especially right now, uh, has been one of the hottest markets because people want to want to rent. People are looking to to buy single family homes. I mean, the interest rates are trem ridiculously low, still ridiculously low. But the one thing that you have to be careful on in the single family is are you buying properties that are falling apart? Because that's what I see. There's a lot of old properties right now and people betting on old properties and then all of a sudden, like they're falling apart. You know, you need a new roof. You need a you know new uh, septic system if you're in the East Coast. You need an all this, and all those things add up. So if you're buying a real estate property and brand new into the game, just know that in, a, invest in really getting yourself educated into knowing why you're buying. Because it, it, from the outside, it may look like a good deal, but once you get into the property and, and things start breaking, it could cost you a lot of money. And a lot of people don't, don't put that on consideration roof yeah furnaces all those things so how do you what what are you doing in order to offset those costs you know that's it's a it's a big mistake i often see uh people they look at a a house or they look at a rental property and and they say okay 10 percent returns but they forget about all the deferred maintenance <laughs> you know like you said all those big items i mean that's that's a pretty big deal you know and that's why we like the build for rent space <clears throat> and even in that space We've made a lot of mistakes there. Uh, wrong floor plans, wrong area, wrong neighborhood, wrong size, you know, wrong way to market it, different types of finishes. You know, um, we've experimented with that quite a bit. You know, when you look at our fund that's buying this stuff and we're buying by the hundreds, so we're buying this stuff at replacement value. You know, so what we're buying these things at, it's really, I mean, it's, it's way lower than what the existing old stuff is mm -hmm. there for sale. So, for us, you know, that, that, uh, you know, there, obviously there's full warranties, you know, protects us. The cost is lower in so many ways, insurance, you know, all, all, all these benefits, right. And it just creates more 
uh, exit strategies, you know, better, uh, better resale, longer term tenants, you know, all, all these things. So, I mean, I've, I've done both, you know, and uh, I bet on this space, you know, a hundred percent. And that's, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the difference, I guess, well, if you look at the difference between investing in a fund, right. Versus your own property, you know, I guess you got to look at, look, do you, do you like to get dirty? Like if you, if you want to invest in your own property, you want to get dirty, you want to get muddy and you want, you don't care about the investments more of a hobby to you. Well then, then go for it, you know, but, or, Hey, if you think, if you can get, you know, 15, 16% annual returns like we can for our investors, then, you know, go do it. Uh, but when you really drill that down, um, you know, it, it, it's, if you have the time to do it and you want, you want to get dirty and learn, well, go for it, you know, but it, it, it's really just up to you. I mean, what's important for you? <laughs> yeah, and that's what I love about, you know, when, when you talk about building brand new construction in a single family space, I think that's a genius move because you're deferring all those maintenance costs 10, 20 years even. Because the, the reality yeah. is that uh, uh, like the, the average roof will last 10, 15 years. The average, you know, uh, uh, furnace, I mean, I'm talking in Northeast here, it, it will last, you know, 10, 15 years too. But... Uh, some people don't um, take that into consideration. They look at a 10% or 15% return, but a roof leak or something breaks and it starts eating up your profits. Uh, but you have, when you have new construction and when you, where, where you're actually buying, what you're doing is buying these lots at a bulk and, and getting deals with construction companies and contractors to be able to actually build these units at a discount, it's, it's huge. It's huge because now you have an upside. You actually could, you actually buying at a at a lower price from the market, so you have equity jumping in, and that's where where the smart play is buying deals when you have building equity ready. And there's there's not a lot of deals out there right now in the open space in the sing, in the market, the single family market. You can actually do that. I think that's one of the reasons that your strategy of buying new construction, you could actually do that by buying new construction because you're you're buy, you're getting deals from the contractor. You're actually negotiating a lower price from the builder not necessarily from the market so how yep. many how many um units are you like what's what's the plan right now in this first project that you have or the project that you're working on how many units are you are you, are you building right now so this first uh well we've done quite a bit of projects but this current project um so we've done you know thousands of these uh with with different funds and uh you know so my my role on kind of the acquisition side was to help assemble these. And we've done, you know, we were the company to, that where investment funds or builders would call us to assemble this stuff, right? Whether land or homes. And with our relationships with builders, we helped, we, we built software for analysis for them. So we add a lot of value on the consulting side. So we give them direction on what to build, where, you know, and, and, and then we assemble the land for them. Like we just got a, an order for a, you know, 300 lots uh, from a builder. So we're like right at the tip of the faucet, you, if you will, of that information mm -hmm. from the builders. And of course our relationships run deep that put us as a big resource, um, you know, to benefit our investors uh, in the fund. Um, so this fund, this current fund that we have, uh, we'll have about a hundred houses in that one. And that'll be, you know, built pretty much at the same time. And, um, you know, those, those efficiencies, the scale that we have is kind of that, that's the minimum number about that, that hundred. And, he, and here's the beautiful thing about the strategy, you know, talking to Daniel, when he started to explain to me, you know, why this is the, uh, the best move instead of buying a hundred units in a, in an apartment complex is because if something happens with a market, if you buy a hundred units in a, in an apartment complex, you can sell those units one by one. You, you can't yeah. sell, like you can't, you have to offload the entire apartment complex in order for you to be liquid. With this strategy, you have a hundred units and if you need the cash, you could actually sell 20 or 10 or five in order to, to see where the market is moving. And that's the genius, the genius part about the, your, your fund is you actually have versatility. You actually have an, a different game plan than just the average person who's just looking to acquire the average fund and looking to acquire more units by buying these big apartment complexes. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, you know, when you look at the space of asset classes too, um, and we were paying very close attention to this, um, the apartment space and the commercial space, there's just more debt, right? Because the lending is still the wild west on that, right? There's not as much regulation. So again, that all with all the foreclosures and issues back when our barber was buying four or five units, um, 
since then they've really, you know, they, they've really buckled down on the regulation. So that said, when you look at the single family rentals, <clears throat> there's by far a lot less debt, right? So it's not going to be upside down as much like it was, right? And there's a lot of exit strategies. Like you said earlier, you know, the trend is more renters than owners. I mean, that that's, and due to the COVID, that's just going to, you know, stack up even more. Um, and then due to the migration, more migration that we're expecting that we're seeing, you know, in our area. And, and, and we focused more on those emerging markets. You know, you look at Florida, you've got the Miamis, the, the, the Orlando's, the Tampa's, we're more on the emerging markets where it's not built out, right? Where it's not sort of capped out or bloated, you might say, like a Miami. Um, and that's where the net migration, the top net migration counties are in the entire U.S. Wow. So you have, I mean, listen, at, at the end of the day, you have to anticipate that there's going to be a great opportunity here, especially as the interest rates will eventually, they have to rise. I mean, this is the economic situation that we're in yeah. right now is not sustainable. They're going to have to rise. And even if, if when they rise, you're going to see a lot, a lot less buyers in the market, a lot more renters. So if you're in the real estate game right now, start looking at your portfolio, diversify your portfolio, start looking at location, uh, locations where people are going. It's not just about buying in your local market because that's what we know. We have to expand our mind and make a decision to actually follow the trends because the moment that you are, that, that you're just stuck in your own city, you're stuck in your own market, you, you have a limited amount of opportunities. Like at this moment, we have we're looking at multiple opportunities, multiple opportunities to be able to to create wealth. And if you're in the market right now, looking to see where the, where real estate is going, just stay pay close attention to the trends. Where are people moving to? What where what are people doing? Especially big companies who now uh, have a little taste of this virtual uh, virtual workspace. You're gonna start seeing a lot more companies deciding to yeah let's go virtual let's go virtual and office space is gonna get hit huge, uh, big uh, multi units are gonna get hit huge because people don't want to be in close space. The single family market, it's is if the interest rates go up, they are also gonna get hit if, by by the by the buyers. But the one place where you count on is the rental the rental space. People yeah. wanna people have unless people are going to be sleeping in the street. <laughs> There's always going to be a market for, for rental. And that's one of the yeah. things that, that, uh, that in my, in my portfolio as well, like we have rental properties, like is they, the rental prices have always gone up. Yeah, they, nobody's ever asked me, they, they haven't gone down to, to dramatic prices, like the, the, the value of the property. So if you have a property, if you're wondering, should I invest in real estate? And is it going to go up? Don't buy real estate expecting the prices to go up. Buy real estate looking to make sure that you're cash flowing every single time. And that's where the rental market is important because every single one of our rental properties, they've always been consistent on the rental. Like my rental properties have always, have always been, um, has been rented. The value maybe went down, but the, the rental was always there. And that's one of the stats that we're seeing right now is that the, the prices for rent are always increasing. When the market crashes, when the market is down, rental properties actually do the opposite. Rental properties go up. The, the rental income goes up. So you have to start looking at, at some of those trends. Uh, Daniel, uh, I know that you, your time is uh, valuable. How can they get a hold of you to get, get more information? Because I know you have a, a lot more information. You have slides and you have a whole sure. deck for people to, to actually uh, learn from this and if you're interested in, in knowing more about where the trends are going uh get in touch with daniel uh send him daniel could, could you be open to send my uh, audience like the uh, presentation that you went through with me where the the trends are going to can you send that sure to yeah yeah i've got a couple slides i can send um to your point on the rental rate side i've got one that's uh really good um it shows the single family rentals in terms of how it dropped off in, in a graph comparing bonds and stocks. So that, that's it's a big one, uh, you know, and, and basically it's got the lowest volatility with the, you know, with the highest returns overall of any asset class. And that's why those same articles and those kind of graphs that have come out by, you know, uh, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Blackstone, all those, you know, they're, uh, you know, they've proven that model and they have that data uh, to back it up. So I'd be happy to share some of that stuff. Obviously in our deck, we have other proprietary stuff. Um, 
something you said to your point in terms of tracking trends, you know, if you are in your own real estate market and you're paying attention to, you know, what's happening out there, you know, look beyond just the price, right? You know, you go on and say, oh, here's a comp for this at, you know, 300,000, I can buy this for 250. You really got to look beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's for us, I, I layer like demographics, right? So migration, who's living here, um, you know, what are they? Who are they? Right. But then the psychographics, uh, which is the technology that has come a long ways, you know, for me as an asset manager, fund manager, I can really drill down. Like, who are these people? Why are they buyers? Why are they tenants? What are their habits? You know, what are their values? And it's, it's, it's really extensive that, uh, you know, the access that we get to be able to make these kind of decisions. Um, We've got a lot of stuff, material that I can uh, I can show you and just give you a bird's eye view of, you know, how we make our decisions and some graphs that um, uh, I'd be happy to send over. Also, so here's what I want to do because I know this content. Uh, we could we talk for hours about this, and I want to respect yeah. the audience because my content is always more motivational, more mindset, and and how to get shit done. I want my audience to understand that, you know, part of of getting shit done is being smart with your money part of getting shit done is being able to expand your business and create wealth and create leverage so it's not just about having a mindset of being unstoppable it's also being able to to allocate your assets in a way that they're going to start making you money so if you like this conversation and want to continue talking about real estate and investments uh whether you listen to me on on, on itunes spotify whether you're watching this through youtube uh, comment below questions on real estate questions on investment and we're going to answer those questions and maybe daniel if you open we'll have you back into the show we'll have you back and and we could answer some of those questions that we make maybe even make into a series because i know it's a conversation that needs to have a little longer period of time for us to to really get deep on it but at the same time i also yeah. want to want to give out your information so they could contact sure. you if you have any if they have any questions about some of the trends what's your why don't you give them your email address from yeah, from yeah so the best uh email is daniel that's D-A-N-I-E-L, at Baxon Capital. That's B-A-X-O-N Capital.com. I'm going to put all that information here in the comments or, or anywhere I have my team uh, put it put it also in the screen. Sure. Um, so just give us some questions. We'll, we're here to answer your questions. Uh, next time I'll have you back in, uh, maybe next month, Daniel, and we'll have some slides in there because I'm, I know there's going to be so many opportunities. And right now, if, if you listen to this, it's time for you to start getting your mindset right in order for you to make decisions when the opportunities arises because the COVID yeah. thing is not over yet. I mean, I've already seen some of the trends that in some states, COVID is actually spiking. I was lucky that I got COVID uh, early on this last couple of months and I was uh, I have the, the, the tiger blood now, I have the immunity. I and mean, my son was, <laughs> was tested today and he has immunity. My, my wife has immunity and now my, my daughter was tested. We're gonna see if she has it or not, but this is not gonna be over. We're gonna start seeing another wave. They said that September is gonna be another wave of COVID. So th that always brings opportunities of where can we uh, invest? What, what are we seeing? What are some of the trends? I know real estate is a, is a moving target. So if you're in the real estate game, just know that, that right now we have to follow the trends. We have to look at the trends a lot closer than before because it's not about putting things on the wall, hoping it sticks. Now it's about being smart because the decision you make today is going to pay out in the next decade. Whether whether you lose or win, we're gonna see the the big picture in the next ten years because we're gonna look back at this moment and gonna realize that the game changed. And right now we have to be around game changers if we wanna be able to take advantage of the opportunity. So thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Appreciate you coming to the Daily Edge podcast. Brother. Until next yeah. time, learn it, live it, experience it, love life. If you like this podcast, send me a text to my community platform at 203-405-9199 for exclusive content and direct access to me so I can take your life to the next level. That's 203-405-9199. Send me a text now.